Anderson and as Executive Director of the Nantucket Athenaeum, I want to welcome you to one of the most anticipated events of our festival, the lecture demonstration. Through the generosity of our lead corporate sponsor, Northern Trust, and our many individual dance sponsors, the dance festival is able to raise much needed funds so that we can provide more than 800 free programs to our community throughout the year. And today's program, I think, is an outstanding example of the kind of high quality program that we really strive to bring to Nantucket for our community. And I hope that many of you will return on Saturday morning with children ages 5 to 12 when we have a really wonderful interactive children's program based on Midsummer Night's Dream. And of course, I'm sure you're coming to Friday and or Saturday night's performances. Thank you all for coming and please join me in welcoming our Festival's Associate Artistic Director, Tyler Engel, and the most wonderful festival dance company. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. So, just before we start, I want to say that, and this is not only because I have to dance in the program as well, but I've asked all of the dancers to go through this lecture demonstration in a light way physically so they can still do everything that they need to in this evening's dress rehearsal and for the performances on Friday and Saturday. Um, and I also didn't want to work too hard myself, so. <laughs> it's hard to talk and to dance. Um, I'm happy that you all came. I think this is a really great opportunity to talk about something that we, as dancers, don't get to talk a lot about which is what we do, because it's a silent art form. And I was thinking how to go about talking about a program. This program came together not with some overarching, it wasn't a theory of mine, I was going to sit down and try to show the audience one specific thing. It was not a, an idea, it's kind of like the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. I just picked a bunch of different things that I thought aesthetically went together very well and were interesting in their contrasting natures. And then I was also thinking, something that happened after the whole program came together is one of the overarching themes is that it's a very social thing that we do. Unlike being a uh, pianist or a violinist, um, you know, some a solo artist that's, you know, years and many hours of practicing by yourself, um, we get to do something that's social. And I think that part of what makes watching dance interesting from the house is to see the interactions between the dancers on the stage. So that's kind of my opening gambit. We'll see if it turns out at the end. You can let me know. The first ballet on this evening's program, or tomorrow evening's program, is False Fantasy, a ballet that George Balanchine choreographed three separate times. And we're using the last version, which he did in 1964, I believe. Um, and it's a really exceptional ballet. Uh, that sort of goes back to his childhood in St. Petersburg. You really feel the kind of Russianness in the music, and you feel the Russianness in the dancing. And I think what's very interesting, and I'm happy about in this year's festival, is that we have four court of ballet ladies with us. If you can please come out. We have Lydia Wellington, Sarah Adams, Gretchen Smith, and Kristen Sagan. And they're actually going to be demonstrating our first, um, our first little segment. Because I'm really, I'm excited about this program because we're not just going to see excerpts of things outside of their, um, outside of their natural habitat. We're going to see ballets, a lot of ballets in the program that are, are done full. Um, and these ladies open the ballet with actually more dancing almost than many lead couples will do in the first minute and a half. You guys are already fully tired probably by the time they come on, right? No, it's easy. They're being modest. Okay, so we're going to put the music on and we're going to have them rush out and show us the beginning of False Fantasy.
They're breathing hard. I told you they were going to mark it, but they're really breathing hard. So they run out from the wing, they stop, and then they start dancing. The music's kind of quiet. The music's sort of... I don't know. I mean, the music has so many wonderful things in it, but they're doing it. Their feet are always moving. They're running around. They're bending. And it's a sort of, uh, I think, very sumptuous nature. I mean, you, you see this step. Can you show me the first step when you do this step, okay? You have a long note in the fast waltz, and they all lean through the hip. It's really beautiful. And I have a quote from, I think, John Martin from the New York Times when this ballet premiered. And let me find it, let me find it. He says, the music, winning and melodious, with no break, no change of tempo, passes from persuasiveness to hypnosis, and it's easy to realize why once the genteel waltz was considered an instrument of the devil. I mean, really, it's, it's kind of amazing. And what we're about to see, and I stopped right before, I'm going to take the music back a little bit so we can have the, um, the principal couple, my brother, Jared Angle, and uh, Miami City Ballet principal dancer, Patricia Delgado, run out and join the group. something very devious going on with the legs always moving and there's subtle but very precarious things that are happening if you can show us when you're coming back like this and you flip the wrong way and then has to catch so something that's really extraordinary oh yeah wait hold on it would come together do it kind of slowly so they can see by which she turns So this is slow, and that's kind of easy. If he's not there, <laughs> this happens. Because her weight is already coming back. So this brings us to, there, there, there are trust issues in ballet, things that we'll explore later on with other pieces. But because the music is so fast, and because the steps are so intricate, and the turns are happening at the same time, she has to know that he's going to be there. Because she's going to jump, regardless of whether she feels him or not. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. So this is the first kind of dancing together we see. We see the four ladies coming out, having to dance in unison, but also having to feel one another when they're running around in these patterns. They have to be aware of where, the, where, where each other are. They have to be aware of what each other is doing, where they're looking, how their bodies are moving together which contrasts with how the principal couple comes out, which they don't have to be as kind of peripherally, peripherally aware. They have to know, like we just showed, they have to know that the person's going to be there even though they don't see them. So it's a different kind of thing. The second thing on the program, which is an entirely different sort of relating between two people, is the parada from Christopher Wielden's Mercurial Maneuvers that he choreographed in 2000, I think. And I'm going to be doing this with my partner, Jenny Smoji. And unlike the kind of very demonstrative, immediately in your face, kind of ebullient and, and joyful dancing that we just saw, this is a very intimate look at how two people can react and see each other on the stage. It's kind of, whereas this is kind of, 
I think it's sentimentality without being sentimental, if that makes any sense, is what I kind of see in the music and in this piece. It's, you know, shades of it. In Mercurial, you just get really kind of heart-wrenching, deep sort of intimate feelings between two people. And we're going to show, actually, the kind of the crux of this pata that we're going to show. Okay. And actually, we have a wonderful pianist with us, Cameron Grant, who will be playing live for the performances. And Unbidden came to me and said that he would play the excerpt from Mercurial, which you will not get to hear live, but you'll get to hear live right now. So thanks. I'll, I'll let you know. This is where it gets difficult because I can't dance with the mic. So, in this, we see, wait a minute, I'm going to talk to you, because I have my breath, I lost my breath. Immediately, we kind of see the difference between what was happening in False Fantasy with what was happening in this. Um, we see several times the ballerina collapsing into my arms, so she's running forward, and the full body is collapsing. Or, when she runs and throws herself quite violently, if it is, up in this lift, into the split, and we flip and we hold. And then there's one other thing that you never see in Ball's Fantasy. You see stillness in three separate times. We're still in this lift. We're standing still looking at someone else. And then, hopefully, we're still in this high lift for a very long time. <laughs> What are you feel when you run to me in this big lift? What are you feeling beforehand? Yeah. I, I feel like this whole part of it is about give and take. Kind of has that sense to me. So there's this urgency uh, to get to him, yeah. and then there's sort of the quiet moment once we're together. Yeah. The end. And what? Even though it's a very long pause, when we're standing and looking at one another, has it ever felt awkward to you? Yeah. No. It's interesting how that happens, because it actually can be, if you've ever sat next to someone at dinner and looked at them quietly for a very long time, it can be awkward. <laughs> but this somehow, when it comes, is not awkward at all. Somehow, because there's such a giving up, we've both 
given of ourselves enough that when we've stood, we're looking and seeing without any, any guys, the other person. So we're seeing a kind of more modern sensibility, a much more 21st sensibility um, of the way people are interacting compared to Vol's fantasy, which is, you know, which was made during the 60s and it was a, there's, you know, less of an, less of an undertone of, of uh, less dissonance, less angst, I think. The third, well, actually, no, you're going to have to just come Friday to see the third piece on the program, which is a brand new world premiere ballet by Justin Peck. But because it's never been performed before, I think it's nice to let pieces get a voice of their own before you really start to delve in and dissect. You know, you have to let things kind of mature a bit. So we're going to go to the, the kind of, I guess it would be the anchor of the program. It's, it's definitely the longest piece, um, a masterpiece in my opinion a ballet called Seven Sonatas by Alexei Ramansky. It was choreographed in 2009, and it was choreographed for a gala that the American Ballet Theater was doing in Avery Fisher Hall, which is a concert house, which means that unlike this stage, or most stages that you see dance on, there were no wings. It's wooden walls with one door in the back, and one door in the back over here. So you can kind of keep in mind while you're watching it that the dancers all have to exit walking up stage, or a lot of the entrances and exits happen from the top right corner of the stage because of this reason. We'll see if they're ready soon. Cameron is also going to play this excerpt for us from the first, um, from the first another. Are we ready, crew, folks? David, Philip, awesome, all right. And then everything rolls around, and then out of nowhere, all six of them start dancing in unison. 
Um, I think it's very interesting that we're going back. I don't know. It's interesting to me that again, it's like a fractured approach as we're coming more, becoming more modern from the kind of classical. Um, simple symmetry of the Balanchine Valley that we saw in the beginning to the kind of collapsing bodies that we saw to the Wielden. And then this is, we have six individuals on the stage doing, doing their own bits. Can, can you speak a little bit about emotionally what he tries to get out of you when he's choreographing? Whoever wants to go. This is the second ballet Alexei did for, for ABT, and I think we were all still a little nervous working with him because he came in as resident choreographer right away. I think for me, at least personally, um, I really try and imitate Alexei's movement. I know that seems a little counterintuitive to the true artist creating their own path, but I find that watching him in the studio, he really, is his own sort of embodiment of his movement. And if you watch him really closely, you can pick up stylistically what he wants and then you can not only make it your own, but technically add stuff, pirouettes, jumps. But if you really just hone in on sort of his movement and what he's trying to portray, I think that makes it most successful. You have a lot of kind of character bits. When, when you were working with him, and the arms that you have, and the kind of the shaking of the head that you have, and your are potted with David, did he give you any sort of specific ideas about where that comes from? Um, no, uh, no emotion behind it, just um, really like a lot of movements that I guess come off as emotion, but um, my part's basically kind of a flirty, I say, like, carefree kind of in a way but um no again no like story behind it or anything like that i'm sorry i didn't introduce the dancers before they came out we have stella Guerra, ziamar reyes blaine hoven christine shevchenko david Holberg, and joseph phillips um, <laughs> thank you very much. There's one other, I think, interesting thing, and I don't know whether Alexei talked with them about this when he was choreographing. The last piece, and Cameron, thank you very much for your beautiful playing. The last of the seven sonatas uh, is a kind of somber, um, is, a, is a somber way to finish, but it's, it's funny because it's generally known as the cat's fugue, yes. And one of our staff pianists at the New York City Ballet, a wonderful man by the name of Boris Polyankin, many years ago told me this. He said, well, you know, Scarlatti was kind of a very big man and would just sit at his keyboard and occasionally his cat would walk across the keyboard, which, you know, he called, I don't, I don't know, I think he had a name for it. And, and so apparently the rumor is, is that the cat walked across these first six notes. And do, can you give us the first six notes? Sorry. It's a really interesting way to start the, uh, the fugue. And this is apparently how this kind of eccentric sound came across, it's because of a cat's paw walking across the keyboard. I mean, you can kind of see something sneaking across the keyboard like this. So this will give you, and even though, again, I, like, I know that they were saying that Alexei didn't give them anything specific to hold on to. I know, having worked with him myself, that he loves a kind of backstory to, um, to a piece of music or to a movement. Even though he doesn't tell you about it, he likes to know that something is there. It gives it a bit of unspoken richness. Cam, thank you. That's the last thing I'll ask you to play. Yeah. Thank you. 
This is a really exceptional solo that was choreographed for Sean by a German choreographer named Marco Gurka in 2004, six, something like that. We can get specific later, I'll put it up on the website. Um, and the first I saw its premiere at the, um, at the Joyce when Sean was dancing with Peter Bull and Company, who's now the director of the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, and I was actually sitting with Benjamin Millipier, the artistic director of the festival, and we both, I mean, it's kind of like getting smacked in the face in a great way. Wow, what's going on here? Um, and I was hoping that Sean could speak to us because it's so different. I mean, it's really, really different from everything else in the program, except I think at the time it comes in the program, it is kind of like a slap in the face in a good way. Um, it wakes you up a little bit and it takes you out of yourself. And, we get to see movement in a different way, and we also get to see someone, because this is the only solo work on the program, we get to see someone not interacting with other people, but we have someone interacting with themselves. I don't know, their emotions or something, and I was hoping that Sean could speak with us about the making of the ballet, and then about emotionally what is kind of going on. Are you ready to speak? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess like what you were saying about this being so different, from other things on the program that are more classically ballet based. Um, for me, this was actually the first thing I'd ever done that was like it, or that was not ballet balladic. So for me, the choreographic process was like completely new territory. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. And, uh, no, it's okay. And uh, so it was really exciting for me as a dancer, and also I was much younger. So it was just like really, it was just like, I mean, it was really new for me and really exciting and I just kind of felt like, because it wasn't balletic, what he was asking for was so, the movements are so kind of small and specific that it was just a lot about energy and, you know, that was just really fun to tackle. I remember Sean saying when he was rehearsing this in New York this past week, he said, you know, we made this. It was all about using as much energy as you could possibly use. And he said, that many years ago when we did it, I thought that was really fun, but it's not so fun anymore. <laughs> because you really, you expend the entire time. Actually, Sean just landed, and he's facing you like this. And then the next thing he does is he's got to hop off stage, not using his hands. Yeah, you hop, you hop to center. I mean, it's really, it's highly, highly physical work. Um, also, I believe that it was made originally as part of a larger a larger work for the New York Choreographic Institute with three other dancers? Well, there was a, it was another piece. It was another piece. Okay. So it kind of had a life beyond, and, and I think Sean said that two weeks before the premiere of this ballet, they were still working with different music. Yes, and Marco brought something in completely different, and I think before, it was more like Marco was giving you the steps and you were fitting them in, and then he brought in new music and wanted to kind of solidify things. Yeah, um, he choreographed it initially months and months before the premiere and then went back to Germany and came back like a week before the premiere. And when he came back, he ch had changed this whole, the, the centerpiece of it is this uh, Bach music, but it used to be something completely different. That being said, he choreographed a lot in silence, so he kind of let me fit the choreography to the music myself and then if he liked one thing or didn't like another, he would change it or say do this faster, do this slower, or do this movement on this specific note or something like that. So that all happened like once, months before and then again, right before the premiere. And then does it, like speaking of the design and the kind of the production quality of the of the work, it's very it's very European in its sensibilities. It's dark. It starts with a kind of line of light in the back, and I think you also told me that when this was being done at the Joyce, and I thought you were kidding when you said this, but I think you were for real, is that Marco wanted a live chainsaw to be pulled across the back of the stage? I mean, like, that one of his original ideas was to have a chainsaw that was um, <laughs> being pulled not by me, or by someone from the wings, across the back of the stage while cutting, hopefully, the stage. And Peter Bull was like, no. <laughs> so that was that. And you said also, there, there were other design ideas that I don't know made it in, but... Um, yeah, another uh, musical thing that he had thought of in the beginning was he had these tiny little music box things that were really small that he would wind up. 
and he, I think, had an idea to put them all over the house. But when we were first working on it, he wound them, like, however many he had, like, 25, and just put them around the studio, and, you know, because the, some would die, like, sooner than others, it would be this weird overlapping of these weird music box things. But that didn't make it in either. <laughs> so we're going from something very, kind of, highly delicate, and finely wrought, and kind of erudite, to Baroque piano sonatas, moving into something that's super highly conceptual. No, no, you have more. I'll have to leave the stage. Right? <laughs> moving into something that would be really highly conceptual. Um, but still, we're in, you know, we're in a, it's a Baroque time period, it's a Baroque cello concerto that we're starting with. And then you do a bit in silence, and then some kind of really interesting music comes along. And I, I don't know, has, did Marco say anything about why there was a music change? No, um, no. No? I mean, I just think that would be cool. Yeah? Can we do a little bit of the... Just so you're not caught completely off guard when you come Friday night, he's going to do a little bit of the second... Um, the second part of the and our four lovely chord ballet ladies from False Fantasy. And we're just going to show you a bit of the end of the ballet.
Actually, can I have you come out one more time? <laughs> What's really interesting about this, I think, let me get my numbers right. <laughs> this was choreographed in 1946. Does it look that old to you? Because it doesn't look that old to me. And it doesn't feel that old to me when I'm dancing it. I mean, I don't know about you, but it feels still very, very modern. And I have a feeling that that has something to do with the music, which is the shortest span of anything on the program when it was composed and when it was choreographed to. It was commissioned by Balanchine from Hindemith, in 1940, and it was completed, and then he didn't use it until 1946. But, you know, Vol's fantasy is about 110 years between the music and the choreography. Seven Sonatas is about 300. Mopi is also about 300. And this is six. You know, the difference between when it was composed and when it was choreographed to is six years, which is kind of amazing. And, and I'm just noticing this right now, in my solo, what I was talking about today, with the legs, can you show what our movements are doing in the back? And, okay, that to me looks like it could have been in Mopi. Like, I feel like these girls could be in the back doing this while Sean is doing his kind of other crazy movements. Um, also, what you will see in 1946 is when all six of us start collapsing before the very end, which is something that we saw in the Wheeling Valley, but it was choreographed in 2000. You can't imagine in the 40s, when everybody was really still doing classical ballet, which was done 20 years before Vols Fantasy, which is classical ballet, and then you see six people melting from the sternum down on the floor. I mean, it really must have been something to see when they were doing it. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. All right. Thank you very much. The last thing on the program, which is kind of a, uh, it's an eccentric closer, I'll grant you, but I think it's really nice at the end of this program where we've really, we've, uh, we've run the course of human emotion in this program, I think. <laughs> we've seen the, we've seen light and airy, we've seen sensual, we've seen highly emotional, sad, dis I mean, we've, we've, seen, we've seen almost everything. And we saw one of the four temperaments saying winning, which we just looked at. And the last thing is a ballet called Tarantella, which they're warming themselves up right now. Because apparently it's music that was written to, I think I have this right, when people were bitten by, by, spider, by, by a tarantula, they apparently danced in a certain way to try to have the venom not go into any big organs of the body, which doesn't make sense to me, because when you move a lot, your blood pumps faster to the heart, but they didn't know that. <laughs> um, and this is something that's very, very light. When was this, this was done? This was done in 1964, so very, I think the same year as, um, as Vols Fantasy, but very, very different. We're going into like an old kind of character ballet, where things like clarity and point work and the turnout of the legs, they all exist in this ballet, but we're not really looking at that. We're looking at one thing, and I think it's the way these two people are relating to one another. And unlike the other potters that we see this evening, they never dance together. There is no supported action ever between the two of them. The only thing that they do is clap each other's hands. And then at one point in the end, he's trying to knock her off her toe shoes with his tambourine. But other than that, there's no actually supported partnering work in this seven-minute potata. They never once do it, so I think it's kind of interesting. It starts in a really fun way, too. You kind of maybe think that you're in Napoli running through the hills. So we better see that when you come out, right?
equally as much as a relationship, just a different one. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't do the introductions again. This is Taylor Stanley and Lauren King. They're brand new solos for the New York City Gallery. Thank you very much. We're drawing to a close. We have about five minutes before we have to do a warm-up class for this evening's dress rehearsal. Um, I let everybody go and kind of get ready for the evening, but if you have any questions for me about, gosh, I really think this program is too disjointed, Mr. Angle. Come on, no, I'm just kidding. But if anybody has any questions, I'd, I'd, I'll take them now. about the choreographer, the German choreographer, Marco. Where is he a uh, choreographer in Stuttgart or in, and where in Germany? He doesn't work, I don't think, with a specific company. He has uh, worked with the Stuttgart before, I know, because a dancer um, named Friedemann Vogel has done this particular solo. Um, but no, I think when he was choreographing this for Sean, I, he was a freelance choreographer. It was great fun. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. The, uh, the song that young men did, uh, what makes that ballet and not modern dance? Well, this is interesting, and this is actually a question I think that a lot of my colleagues and myself ask ourselves, um, because the lines are very blurred now, and it's interesting that you use the term modern dance, because when we think in this year, modern dance, I think of Martha Graham. That, that to me is modern dance, something that's kind of highly codified with specifics, whereas I don't really know what the difference is, but this is, I would maybe say that this is a contemporary work as opposed to a modern work. Um, ballet, it, it's definitely not ballet, you know. But then again, the lines are skewed because I think in 1946, when Balanchine was having a, a ballerina creep forward like this, I don't know if that was ballet when he was doing that either. So I think if we put too specific of terminology on on types of dance, they lose, I think, some of their texture. Um, because Sean does do a fair amount of ballet steps. They're just hidden behind a lot of angst and you know, dark clothing. I mean, he does a, he, he'll, he'll be doing a double tour, a very you know, male bravura step up in the back. He'll do a double tour, and then he lands on his, on his bottom and starts scooting off the stage again. So it's kind of a, a melding of the, of the idioms. My background, um, as a ballet dancer, is my background. But I've been fortunate enough in my. She asked what my background was, and I assume you mean my my dance training. I was trained in the kind of American version of the Petipop school, so this you know kind of very straightforward Russian sort of ballet. But I've been fortunate enough in my career to have worked with a lot of different um, choreographers across the across the range. We have two questions in the front. I, I, I have the microphone if you don't mind and then me going. Then I'll go okay. okay. I wanted to ask about the process of how you select your company. Um, and if a dancer drops out, how often do you have to um, keep up with recruiting dancers? Um, when I was putting together this program, I just I decided that it would be, I think that you end up with the best from a program standpoint. and. It ended up being from a personnel standpoint too. We ended up with the best organization of things if I focused on what ballets were going first. So I didn't I didn't start with a list of names that I thought would be good. I started with a list of ballets that I thought would be good, and it just happens that you know the best people were dancing those ballets, and then they were able to come and um, and do this. It is interesting because originally a dancer named Sterling Hilton, who's also from she's a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet. She had a ankle sprain the, the, the last day of our season in New York. And so then two weeks later, we, she kind of called me and she said, I don't think I'm going to be able to do what you need me to do in Nantucket. Um, and then Justin and I got together, the choreographer for the new ballet, and we were talking about you know, people that could you know, fill, the, fill the spot that she was going to have to vacate. And Lauren actually had another engagement that I begged, we begged her to get out of, which she did, and we're so happy that she's here. And, and it was actually, it was nice that 
Sterling told us early enough because Lauren was able to be involved from the very beginning for the making of the new ballet. So this, what you're seeing is all her. I mean, it's you know all Justin Peck, but all Lauren King. But that you're seeing on the stage, she didn't have to come in halfway through that process and kind of learn what someone else's body had come up with, which I think is nice. <laughs> How long did it take for you to put this piece together? That's a good question. Um, it actually took a bit of time. Um, I'm trying to think. Maybe, maybe three months. Is there a part B? No, okay. Um, I think it took me about three months, and it was difficult because we had to, this, the, the wonderful middle, middle ballet that we have, Seven Sonatas, is still under exclusive contract with the American Ballet Theater. So it took a little bit of, ask, you know, I wrote to Alexi and asked, could we, we have this ballet, and he said, sure, but, you know, I, I'm fine, but you have to get a yes from, from, the, uh, from the ABT, and so then we had discussions with their executive director and their artistic director, and, um, and because we have all of their dancers, all of whom have done the piece, the majority of which were originals in the ballet, they, they allowed us. We also have, very kindly from, from the company, the original costumes as well, so... Three months. But that's why... Oh, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought because I'm, I'm going back to... Until I knew that Seven Sonatas was a go, which I kind of had the whole program sketched out on a piece of paper, but then if we had the, the kind of longest anchor of the program, if all of a sudden they said we couldn't have it, then we'd have to kind of, I would have had to start from the beginning finding something else. So once that was done, then the process moved kind of quickly. Hi. This is just a beautiful palette selection of pieces you put together. And with all the jewels out there, Romanski and all the balance works, how do you go about sifting through and picking just five, seven pieces out of all those hundreds of brilliant works? Well, so you kind of, you'll say you caught me in, not a lie, but, so when I said that I, that I picked the pieces first and then not the dancers, so it goes half and half. Very quickly after you pick the pieces, then you have to start, you know, asking around gently if people are available to do what it is you want them to do. And so if they're not available, then you kind of have to, you know, scoot around and do other things. But, um, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. And I brought up the Barnes collection before, and I don't know if you've seen it. If you, if you haven't, it's maybe worth a trip to Philadelphia. And I wouldn't say that about everything, but it's a really beautiful collection. And this gentleman just went and picked things that he liked. Um, for no reason, just because for the moment he liked the way it looked, and then he bought it, brought it home, and put it on the wall in a place where he just liked the way it looked. And I, in the same way, I think, you know, I was reading things, or actually Jared was reading that, the book called St. Petersburg, about, you know, the Glinka, and maybe that's where false fantasy comes in, I don't know, I just kind of, I let myself be very open to whatever culturally, I think, was maybe going on in my life, and let that kind of inform what, um, what I was going to do. No, my father is a general contractor, and my mother's a preschool teacher. <laughs> um, and my grandfather would say that all the dancing talent came from him, but I don't think that's the truth. Um, no, that's... There's no, we're, we're the first two, or he was the first one, and then I, like any absolutely excellent younger brother, followed in his footsteps. <laughs> well, if that's it, we actually, we have to start kind of getting ready.